세션은 기조 강연과 다섯 개의 패널 강연으로 이루어져 있습니다. 모든 강연이 끝난, 끝나고 공동 질의응답과 토론 시간을 가질 예정입니다. This session will have one keynote speech followed by five panel speeches. After finishing all the speeches, we will have the time for discussion and Q&A at the end of this session. 본 세션의 좌장은 우송대학교 총장님이신 존 앤디 컷 교수님이십니다. 큰 박수로 함께 해 주시기 바랍니다. And now we will present our moderator, Professor John Adicat, the president of Usong University in the Republic of Korea. John Endicott 교수님께서는 터프츠 대학교에서 국제관계 박사를 취득하셨으며 샘난 국제대학원과 조지아 공과대학교의 초대 창립 멤버이십니다. 또한 2005년도에는 노벨 평화상 후보에 오르신 바 있습니다. Professor Adicat got his PhD in International Relations from Tufts University in USA. He was among the first members of the Samnemu School of International Affairs and also of Georgia Tech. He was also nominated as candidate for Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Well, good morning, everyone. We're very fortunate this morning to have a great keynote speaker and wonderful five panelists. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Byung Yang. He's the chancellor of the University of Washington, Bothwell. And he also was president of the State University of New York Institute of Technology at Utica and Rome, actually not far from Endicott, New York. <laughs> he holds a PhD and an MA from Princeton, and a master's from Stanford, and a bachelor's from Dartmouth. He is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. His topic, innovating innovation. But I guess if you take a look closely, it is an innovative way to actually give the title. The title is a lowercase beginning and uppercase ending, so very interesting. It's our pleasure to introduce our speaker today. 안녕하세요. 아, 예병욱입니다. 와 굿, 굿 데이. 아, it is really my honor and pleasure to be speaking before you. And as you know, innovation is a process, but today let's look at innovation as a process as well as an outcome. So with that, Really the period from the second half of the 18th century to the first quarter or half of the 9th century marked the beginning of the industrial age, age as you know. During the industrial revolution, discoveries were made, but these discoveries in machines, power, textiles, and metallurgy were leveraged to create innovative processes and products. The technological revolution, or we call it the second industrial revolution began where the first one left off in the latter half of the 19th century and into the first quarter of the 20th century. New materials, processes, and inventions emerged creating the basis for the innovation century that we are currently in. Electrification, light, flight, petroleum, among many advances were discovered, exploited, and enabled. So if we consider 1940s as the beginning of the atomic in innovation, the Sputnik of the 1950s as the birth of the space innovation, then arguably the 1970s to the present day can be construed as the innovation era for the nano, info, bio. Solid state physics innovation that led to integrated circuits in the 1970s, emergence of personal computers, or we call it the hardware era, of the 1980s, manipulation of genetics and life sciences of the 1990s, and software developments of the 2000s all led to the exponential innovation of the present century. Then since the beginning of time, discoveries have been the precursor of, to innovation. In the modern era, 
higher education institutions, or HEIs, and research institutes have served as incubators for these in inventions and discoveries. The transistor which led to integrated circuits was created in 1947 by John Bardeen, Walter Breton, and William Shockley at the Bell Laboratories. Vacuum tube transistors, through the use of solid state physics, became integrated circuits. Today, we, build, uh, we put billions of transistors on a single wafer of silicon. Now, James Chadwick discovered a neutron in 1932. Two years later, Enrico Fermi published his findings on fission of uranium, and within just a few years of the two important discoveries, scientists and engineers innovated to create the atomic bomb. The discoveries had also led to innovation in energy, medical instrumentation, and more. In the life sciences, James Watson and Francis Crick, their work on the nature of DNA in 1962 led to the innovation of virtually everything around us from medicine to crime fighting. Most of these discoveries have a common thread, HEIs and their research institutes. Early technological innovations and discoveries did not have HEIs or research institutes in their founding unless one considers kingdoms or governments. So gunpowder, ninth century, was discovered by the Tang Dynasty. We know well that the gunpowder and its variants have been innovated since its discovery. For the discoveries that formed the foundation in today's innovation space, their connections to HEIs and research institutes cannot be ignored, as you see in some of the examples. During the same period of technological innovation, we have also been innovating innovation itself, the process innovation. The proportion of investments made in research support for HEIs and research institutes have shifted tremendously. During the Sputnik era, the uh, uh, total research and development, or R&D, spending in the United States in 2014 dollars, so we calculated in 2014 dollars, was about 36.8 billion dollars. More than one half of the investment came from the federal government. Almost 60 years later now, in 2012, less than one third of the investment came from federal government. Today, the private corporations make the lion's share of investments in R&D in the United States. R&D investment has been largely privatized. And in this new private domain, innovation has been encouraged and prospered. With this change, however, innovation has come to be private good rather than public good. Innovation will continue, but with an incremental and corporate orientation as investors target those discoveries, then enhance their market position. After all, these private corporations have to answer to their shareholders. So in 2011, Microsoft spent, outspent every other corporation in R&D, investing over $9.6 billion. In 2012, our favorite uh, search engine, Google, their research budget was more than double for DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency for the U.S. government. In fact, Google invested $1.5 billion in R&D. The surprising part, though, of this investment is the investment, this investment comprised 18% of Google's net revenue. Google's net revenue was $8.14 billion. So this is very, a clear indication that private corporations and their private research institutions believe their future is in the innovation space. In the present day innovation space, innovating innovation will require HEIs and research institutions, particularly, particularly private research institutions, to collaborate. Operating under the business, this business rubric, private corporations must protect their R&D investments. HEIs, on the other hand, have asserted open access to much of the intellectual property generated from research. To foster research collaborations between these two partners, 
there must be some compromise. For many years, government labs and HEIs have enjoyed the control of a talented workforce, intellectual workforce, namely the faculty and researchers. In the recent years, however, increasing number of top flight researchers and faculty have begun migrating to free market environment of private corporations. Students have naturally migrated over to the creative and innovative economy as well. In response, many HEIs in the United States have created physical and programmatic spaces for innovation and entrepreneurship. At the University of Washington, UW, Startup Hall has been established in Seattle and, in, and the Digital Future Lab was created at UW Bothell. Today, virtually all research universities have created programs in entrepreneurship. The UW is also creating maker spaces for many faculty and students who choose to engage in innovation and has begun joint four partnership, uh, partnerships with one of the world's largest technology corporations. I bet you can guess what, which one that one is. And two other world research university, one in Europe and one in Asia. As the first order of innovation has been met, the next, gen next several phases will be harder. The sandbox for innovation will meet the increased, increased challenges of the future. So one would argue that the present innovation era is the result of inventions and discoveries of yesteryears. These discoveries were the result of investments that our governments made for the public good. Based on the statistics kept by the World Bank dating back to 1996, US, we spent 2.44% of our great gross domestic product, GDP, on research and development. A decade and a half later in 2011, we still average around two and three quarter percent of GDP on R&D. As countries beca have become uh, more industrialized, an increasing portion of GDP investments in R&D is observed. Since 1996, Korea has almost doubled its R&D investment, and it shows. China has tripled its R&D investment in 15 years also. Although, one would argue that investments can be seen as catch-up for innovation, a nation cannot maintain its lead without making comparable investment in discoveries. Therein lies a challenge for the present-day leaders in innovation space. In some sectors, discoveries are made while innovating. For example, in the semiconductor space, we have been able to exploit the laws of quantum mechanics and squeeze in more transistors even in a smaller area. However, the fundamental science behind this and other technologies is decades old. How many fundamentally new instruments have been developed in, re in recent years? How old is the science that nanotechnology tools such as atomic force microscopy, scanning tunneling microscopy, nuclear mag magnetic resonance, transmission electron micro micro microscopy, and so on. Without new discoveries and inventions, the tolerance for innovation gets tougher. The second part of innovating innovation is the anatomy of present-day innovation itself. In the 20th century, the entry fee to get into the innovation game was pricey. Innovation required investments that individuals could not afford to make. In the atomic age, the space age, and much of the info nano bio age, only recently the ante to play in the innovation space came down to the individual realm. Today, largely due to the hardware advances that kept true to Moore's law, everyday people can afford to play in the in innovation space or of information. The little science has also enabled students and learners to play in the innovation game. The advances in life sciences and nanotechnology can be made at all levels in HEIs and research institutes. For an entry-level entrepreneur, a dream of creating, couple, uh, creating coupled with a computer and a 3D printer might enable something novel and useful. 
For others, a simple benchtop laboratory might just so solve the problem. In the application space, innovation happens everywhere because the actors of innovation reside at all levels, vertically and horizontally. Abundant in opportunities exist for private and public institutions and enterprises. HEIs need not be research-oriented. This is where innovation in the small sciences space might prove to be the game changer. However, the most significant challenge before us in the innovation space is fostering co collaboration among disparate entities, ideas, and processes, often those outside the technology space. Higher education institutions are uniquely positioned to foster collaboration, not only in the innovation space, driven by research and research-centered universities, but also in the innovation space led by engagement of its student-engaged universities. There are, they are both necessary to innovate innovation. So, Innovation 4.0 in the 21st century requires proper investment in basic sciences and technology so that the discoveries and inventions can necessarily fuel the innovation process. Innovation 4.0 also requires leveraging horizontal and vertical integration of process, processes and products. Higher education institutions and research institutes must lead the way with government and industry partners vertically, horizontally, globally, and locally. Thank you. Thank you, President Jay, and also, I'd like to point out, you saved us four minutes. <laughs> uh, one of the criteria that we have for the length of speeches, 20 minutes for the keynote and 15 minutes for the panelists. So uh, if the panelists will note that we started out in a very good way. <laughs> well, our first panel speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Flavia Schlegel. She's the Assistant Director General for National Sciences, uh, Natural Sciences at UNESCO. She holds a medical doctorate from the University of Zurich and an MS in Organizational Development from the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research and Continuing Ed at the Universities of Klagenfurt and Vienna. Her topic is Promoting a Culture of Innovation in Developing Countries. UNESCO's strategy and key actions, and let's have a nice hand for Dr. Flegel. Well, thank you, Chairman, distinguished panel, keynote speaker, ladies and gentlemen. During the time which is given to me, I'd like to share with you uh, the UNESCO strategy and uh, key actions in promoting a culture of innovation in developing countries. I will quickly start by explaining the context of uh, promoting a culture of innovation in UNESCO, followed by some innovation issues and op opportunities in developing countries, and then I would like to explain our approach and actions to overcome the innovation challenges and make the best use of the opportunities. I will end with a short conclusion. To the introduction, it's uh, extremely important to point out that UNESCO's strategy and actions in promoting a culture of innovation is part of an overall UNESCO integrated policy approach in ST&I, science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development, as also spelled out now in the post-2015 agenda, as we have it right now in front of us. Now, UNESCO's integrated policy was established based on four pillars. And these four pillars are, first of all, strengthening the national capacities in SDI policy formulation. Then, but also in promoting a culture of innovation by facilitating appropriate innovation ecosystem, 
both firm-based but also grassroots innovations, and thirdly, by enhancing of human and institutional capacities in science and engineering. And fourth, improving STI systems, monitoring and foresight to support evidence-based policy-making process. Or as my predecessor, the keynote speaker uh, said, innovation is a process. So where are the challenges, the risks and the opportunities when we are talking about uh, developing countries? Now, in developing countries in general, there are only very few uh, that have an innovation policy or strategy already in place, if any. Most of innovation initiatives in developing countries are high-tech oriented that do not meet the real needs of the poor or marginalized people. There is very limited R&D facility. If any, then it's fragmented and there is a lack of overall coordination. There is a heterogeneous economy with a large number of micro-enterprises operating mainly also in the informal sector. And poor systems of governance to support innovation, such as very heavy bureaucratic <coughs> system, if you, for example, want to de develop an enterprise. Certainly, low education levels will form a significant barrier to the development and the diffu diffusion of innovation. And last but not least, the lack of financial support for innovation in existence of venture capital or other financial support for innovation. But there are also some opportunities and these are the ones we have to thrive on. There is an increased awareness of the importance of innovation. Nobody can be left, uh, there can be left no doubt as to the importance of innovation for prosperity, including for people in developing countries. Different types and degrees of innovation may take place across different stages of development. It is a process. Doing, utilizing and interacting in innovation could be more appropriate to accelerate innovation in developing countries. And some of these countries have experienced rapid economic catch-up. Countries like Chile, China or the Republic of Korea. These countries were able to absorb and creatively adapt international technological knowledge even leapfrog some of them and achieve accelerated growth. Great potential, UNESCO, lies in grassroots innovation. Grassroots innovation to be used to meet the needs of the poorest of the poor. In order to overcome the innovation challenges and make the best use of the opportunity, UNESCO established uh, some approaches and conducted actions in promoting a culture of innovation, particularly for developing countries. And our vision uh, today is that innovation is essential. It is a critical factor for enhancing economic growth and competitiveness. At the same time, it is crucial for social cohesion, equality, and poverty alleviation. UNESCO insists on the importance of grassroots innovations as an equally important source of solutions to meet the needs of developing countries. Innovation should not be regarded uh, as only a private good, but as much as also a public good. Based on our vision on innovation and our experience in dealing with innovation issues in developing countries, UNESCO acts at three levels to build a culture of innovation. First, we are facilitating, with, together with our partners, the development of innovation ecosystems. 
and building an innovation system in a developing country is complex because it involves the formal sector, enterprises, universities, research institutes, the government financial system, along with non-governmental organizations and the informal sector, including grassroots inventors, local and indigenous knowledge. Bridging that formal and informal sector is especially difficult in circumstances of high social disparities. And an effective innovation system should allow private companies to generate wealth and at the same time improve the living conditions of the poor. UNESCO and WTA provided policy advice and technical assistance in this sense in the development of innovation ecosystem in its member states such as Azerbaijan, Colombia, Costa Rica, Egypt, Indonesia, Kenya, Nigeria, Mongolia, Sri Lanka and the Gambia. Now, B, what's the second part? We are encouraging creation of knowledge-based small and medium-sized enterprises by supporting the development of science park and technology business incubator. Both provide an appropriate innovation ecosystem to nurture and to host knowledge-based SMEs. And the ultimate goal is to develop national capacity in creating, nurturing and managing knowledge-based SMEs. The basic mechanism in assisting the creation of knowledge-based SMEs is by bridging the gap between university and industry. You see it on the left side and on the right side of, the, of your slide. Our objective is to create this synergy between the universities and the productive sector. One side, we assist the universities in creating technology business incubators to commercialize their research results. And on the other side, we assist the industries in developing R&D units to support technological innovation. Both of our approaches led, hopefully, to the creation of knowledge-based and thriving SMEs in the country. Some examples of capacity building activities. Since 10 years ago now, UNESCO and WTA organized annually here in this very city international training workshops on science parks and technology business governance. So we're training on an international level, but also on a regional and uh, on a local level. UNESCO and WTA provide to the interested member states with policy advice and technical assistance in all phases of science park and technology business incubator development, including preparation of feasibility studies, elaboration of business plans, and the funding and promoting for foreign investment. There are pilot projects, obviously, in all areas of the world. You see here are some examples in the Arab states, in Africa, Asia Pacific, but also in Latin America, for example, like the, the example in Bogota, Colombia. Or, and this is another initiative, the establishment of a Category 2 center under the auspices of UNESCO. UNESCO supported the creation of a regional center for science parks and tech business incubator in Isfahan, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, in 2009. And... The newest, obviously, initiative, the first Dejan Global Innovation Forum, or this forum, is a new contribution and a new cooperation between WTA and UNESCO with support of the Dejan Metropolitan City Government and INOBIS. Our main expectation is to establish an international platform to gather and to share innovative ideas, 
knowledge and experience and explore the possible cooperation among the innovation stakeholders. I started out with one, facilitate the development of innovation ecosystem, then with B, the encouragement of the creation of knowledge-based SMEs, and now the third one is to promote inclusive innovation for sustainable development because innovation can be a critical tool to deal with poverty and promote social inclusion. Inclusion of the poor in every step of innovation process is the key of success in the pro-poor innovation concept. And grassroots innovation is a primary bottom-up approach for pro-poor innovation. UNESCO supports these grassroots innovations <coughs> excuse me, by empowering people to use science and technology to find affordable solutions to meet the needs of the disadvantaged through popularization of science, technopreneurship development, engineering, and local and indigenous knowledge programs. This means also technology for development, the fostering of north-south, south-south R&D projects, open access, and a close look at what's happening at the maker scene. Coming to the conclusions. Innovation has attracted attention from government, academia, and business players over the past decade and innovation supports economic, environmental, social, and equitable development. Lack of uh, national innovation policy, the shortage of knowledge production, lack of skilled labor, and in existence of financial support system for innovation are some of the key constraints to promote innovation in developing countries. UNESCO, together with its partners, responds by providing policy advice and organizing capacity building activities to facilitate the development of innovation ecosystems, to encourage the creation of knowledge-based SMEs by supporting science parks and technology business incubator, and to promote inclusive innovation for sustainable development. And it, with this, I'd like to thank, in the name of UNESCO and the Director General, the Dejan Metropolitan City, WTA, and Innobis to make this first Global Innovation Forum possible. And I'm looking forward to attend the next uh, Global Innovation Forum, the second one in South Tangerang, Indonesia. Thank you very much. See you soon again. Dr. Schlegel, thank you very much. Do you realize you ended with three seconds to spare? So <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. Our second panelist is the Honorable Dr. El Taib Mustafa, who is the president of Future University, Sudan. Dr. Mustafa holds a PhD and master's in geophysics from Bordeaux University and an engineering diploma from St. Petersburg University in Russia. He's a member of the Arab Academy of Sciences, a corresponding member of the Royal Academy of Overseas Scientists in Belgium and UNESCO. He holds many interesting oversight roles in the innovation field. His topic today, Building Innovation Capabilities in Higher Education Institutions, a view from the South. Sir, thank you. Thank you very much. My presentation will be, I think, uh, a smooth follow-up to the presentation by the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, as it tackles sort of a review of science and technology and innovation in developing countries. And I, I, I thought for such a global forum to be global, it should be inclusive. 
and that the, we should not forget that while we talk about innovation 4.0 here, there are huge difficulties and, and differences and divide in the world. A quick review on what we call the developing countries. These are 134 countries. So it's a massive number of countries which we call the developing countries. Why do we call them developing countries? What is the definition? We have, this is the definition. In fact, a, their per capita income is below 11,905. I don't know why it's 11,905, but that's what the World Bank has decided. So below $12,000 uh, per capita income. This is uh, based on the glo what we call gross national income, not GDP. Now, these countries are characterized by a huge percentage of poverty. The percentage is this seen from the World Bank recent report. 75% of the population live with less than four US dollars per day. 75%. So it's not a, a little percentage. And 50% of those live with less than $2.5 a day. I took also other indicators, the knowledge economy indicators, which is also proposed by the World Bank, which is to group 142 countries in ascending order. You can see that only five from the developing countries are among the top 50. And these mainly are Arab-rich, oil-rich countries, plus, of course, Malaysia, which uh, was presented earlier on. If you look at the, another indicator, which is the Global Innovation Index, then we also see that Although this index now is more comprehensive with uh, sophistication of the business uh, environment and creativity, we find that among the top uh, 50 countries are only eight developing countries. Uh, and you can see the list of these countries in front of you. So we still have a huge difference uh, between this world. Now, two other indicators I picked from the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. These are the classical indicators. First, expenditure on research and development. And this, you can see, it's the percentage of the GDP. So you see how high is it in developing countries, and then it goes very slow, and it reaches 0.1% in most of the developing countries. Uh, the target declared by the UN is 1% of GDP. Another indicator from UNESCO which is the human resource, what we call the number of researchers per million inhabitants. You can see from this map, the darker the color, the fewer scientists. So you can see that the, this lack of scientists is not only in Africa, as people think. It is from Latin America, South Asia, South Asia, and even South East Asia. These dark colors are scientists, 300 blue, uh, the number is 300, and low uh, scientists per, per, uh, per million. Uh, these are the indicators that I sought to share with you to give the uh, sort of the contour of what we call uh, developing countries. Now, we, uh, we, we all know that the, uh, talking about innovation that people forget to remember the definition and I thought we remind ourselves with it and I highlighted the word implementation. The difficulty for developing countries is in this world, innovation, implementation. And most of developing countries are in the process of innovation. So that's why the uh, Latin American countries took an initiative and revised this Oslo manual, uh, sorry, uh, Oslo manual and put, um, I think I have to go back with the red one, uh, Bogota manual which then included the process that lead to innovation. Now this Bogota manual is now an annex to the OECD manual, which is the official uh, Oslo manual. So the process of innovation. Now the triple helix model in developing countries is rather different. 
The universities are only focusing on teaching. No matter what they tell you, the government give budget only for teaching, running costs, and salaries. Very little for scientific research. The second is that the industries in many of these developing countries are large industries by government or with huge shares of government or a number of micro uh, uh, and mini enterprises working mainly in the service area. And these enterprises, the huge one, and the universities are totally dominated by the government budgets and administration. Now, so if, in, in some literature you find it uh, described in this type of, of model, uh, sorry, uh, with all the government dominating the whole spheres. It doesn't go back, yes. But I think that a more realistic way of describing it is what I said in my paper, it is the isolated spheres with very weak links between them. This is where the situation now in most of the developing countries. And the whole challenge is how to go towards overlapping uh, of these uh, things. Now we come to the higher education, which is the topic, I think, of this session. And we all agree that higher education play an important role in, in the innovation and developing regions and so on. But not yet really in developing countries. Uh, the, the effort made by UNESCO is laudable. It is in the right direction. So we still have to put the universities in the development agenda. The second point uh, I wanted to raise here is that the university uh, uh, in our country love to see this, uh, what we call university-led innovation system. And they give all these examples of the MIT and Stanford. And uh, I'm borrowing here a slide from uh, Dr. Atau Rahman who gave the uh, impact of one uh, institution, that is the MIT, and you can see here the figures that the MIT uh, uh, alumni have created for 1,000 enterprises that employ 1.1 million, and that they generate $240 billion, and collectively they can make the 18th economy in the world. So that is, of course, very impressive, and it keeps our institution say, wow, of course we are very far away. A good example also brought by Dr. Atta Rahman is the correlation between investment in higher education and economic development in Korea. This is a very straight correlation. Of course, not only higher education, but the, uh, the correlation is there. Uh, we all uh, listened to the presenter by the uh, advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Malaysia is a good country in this respect. It has been spending very much on higher ed in, in education in general and they have uh, been traditionally the main exporter of technology in the Islamic world. And they represent more than 60% of the overall uh, production of the Islamic countries in technology. Regional clusters, we have been studying all these Korea cases and Finland cases. Uh, so now the situation as we described it looks almost desperate, but I think we, we have uh, we mentioned that the, there is an increase in the higher education uh, population, private sector is coming, open learning and so on. That is, you can see the increase in, in participation, we call it. This is the number of those in secondary school who have access to higher education. It's increasing massively and it's creating nothing but a complete graduate unemployment bomb. So what to do? <laughs> I don't have a solution, but I, I would just like to give some few ideas that the first one would be a follow up to what uh, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO has been saying, that these policies, STI policies, which being adopted by countries and UNESCO has been doing that and will continue certainly to do so, must be implemented. And the main output of these policies is that they should increase the R&D budget to the level we agreed upon, which is 1% of GDP. And they should also render the universities autonomous. There is nothing worse than this terrible control of government on universities. And they, uh, they're providing some fiscal incentive for companies to work with universities. These are a few of the policy orientation that hopefully will be accepted. The universities also have a task to make. They should move away from teaching towards research and entrepreneurship. And I think this is starting. Uh, not, I'm not going to talk about my university, but we are doing that. And other universities are working towards 
this uh, shift to the third mission of the universities. Now, uh, you know, to, to get uh, away from the theory that you have first to spend on scientific research, basic research, and then uh, applied research, because without basic research there is nothing to be applied, I think that has not been working in developing countries, because government has been asking us to make the point and the proof that science and technology are useful. So it is definitely the other way around, applied research first, and then basic research. Because without applied research, you are not going to get any money for you know, developing new things. So make another point which is important, make an extensive use of ICT revolution. I cannot say more. This is a huge revolution that had been discussed here yesterday. I think uh, that when you can see the the change and the possibilities given by ICT for higher education is they are immense. I just give here a citation from the Cisco report that it would take an individual more than five million years towards the amount of videos that cross the internet per one month. This is as of 2000. It's a huge amount. So there is a terrible potential for us all to do this. We have to work on the missing links, and this is what Mr. O had been saying, the science park, the development and creation of these science parks. And uh, I think the universities should also work on flexible IP policies, you know, the you know, sort of uh, patenting and keeping, sticking to the patent might not be the right, it's very expensive, maybe a more flexible approach. Yesterday, the Manchester uh, Surrey University told us how they are doing. We have the problems of funding, of course, no venture capital, nothing. So uh, we have to work on the idea. And there is an initiative, the Arab Science and Technology Foundation is a very good initiative that is giving us uh, the possibility to, for SMEs to be built on individual enterprises. And this shows that there's, this is happening. Uh, I hope by these figures I showed you that the word is not flat. As our uh, Friedman said, it is not flat. Uh, we have difficulties. And we, I'm sure that this forum, if it is to be inclusive, rather than becoming Dejun Innovation Forum, it's Dejun Global Innovation Forum, it must really cater for the developing countries. And I hope the next forum will show more of that. I thank you very much for your attention. Very good. Sir, thank you very much. Our third panelist is Dr. Eberhard Becker. He's Professor Emeritus and former rector of the University of Dortmund. He holds his PhD from the University of Hamburg in math and his diploma as well. He was the chair of the University President's Conference of WTA in the areas 2005 to 2009 uh, in the elections that cover the period. His topic today will be paving the way for innovation. Let's have a wonderful hand. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizer to invite a retired person because I'm no longer actively involved in any process of innovation. I have reached the enjoyable status of an observer, I can tell you, that is something nice. And uh, as such, I would like to convey to you some of the observations. And these observations are clearly are concerned with the role of uh, higher education institution and the role of research and learning and teaching. And um, I was so happy to be the third speaker in the row because my previous speaker, they really prepared everything for me. And um, because I want to comment on some trends in higher education institution and research which will affect, to my understanding, the innovation process across the world. So I want to talk uh, about the innovation policy shortly in the European Union and Germany, and also skipping, nearly skipping, the regional knowledge ecosystems. These first two items, they follow traditional pattern. But then I want to talk about the triple helix and ask myself the question if the triple helix model really the right model and the answer was given by Ms. Schlegel and Mustafa. It's not the complete right model 
to, to be applied all over the world. And then uh, I will go on to the digital future and to research clouds and, and, clouds and uh, explain to you what this might be for the innovation process. So let me start with innovation policy in Europe and in Germany. And um, there was quite recently alarm in Europe. And this alarm has to do with innovation score. And this score was, this ranking list was prepared by the European Union. So I guess uh, we have to trust what the European themselves tell about their status. And for Korean, it's nice to see that they are, sorry, that it was wrong. Nice to see that according to a European score board, they are at the top. So congratulations. And uh, then Europe, 27, that means Europe consisting of 27 member states has ranked four. But for the European, it was a kind of crisis. We should not be at rank four, we should be at the top. But you must say this is a kind of average score because we have 27 member states and the European Union is quite heterogeneous. So in some sense, it's also a good score. But anyway, people, policy make a th thought that Europe is risk losing ground. And in fact, uh, one sees that the innovation leaders, so that are US, Japan, South Korea, they outperform the European Union. And also that in some sense, in some cases, the gap is widening. The gap is widening in the case of South Korea. And sometimes when I'm in South Korea, I'm interested to see that South Korea doesn't have the same perception of the position in the world. We from European say we admire South Korea, but sometimes they see it differently. Anyway, so there are some, some, uh, uh, some incidents that let Europe ask, what is wrong about Europe? And Germany, if you can list up strong, strong uh, data that Germany is strong, but the problem with Germany is the economic power heavily depends on medium high tech, not on the highest tech, high tech. That is our problem. And uh, we are behind world's high tech leaders. And the challenge is that the really high tech innovations are outside Germany. That is a big, big, big concern. And also we see a growing competition in medium high tech sector. And um, therefore, there are challenges either in Europe and or in Germany. And there have been programs, and I just list up some programs. And uh, the second one is especially important for us. That's the European research area. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of money involved, a lot of ideas, a lot of program, really to foster the ability, the ability of Europe to keep up with uh, the competitor outside. And I have no time but in my paper, there are more details to talk about the details. So the European Research Area and the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, these are steps forward to cope with the problems. And in Germany, there's a high-tech strategy as well. Uh, there's a close interaction with the European attempts. And... Um, so I go through rather quickly, you can see the, the, the natural topics. And what is really important is the, um, can I, no. Okay, come to the second item at the top, cluster policy aiming at scientific progress and innovation. That is one topic, one really say high topic of highest, highest concern that we do. And um, the sec that is the situation in Europe and in Germany. So we see we are a little bit behind the top and we have to do special efforts. The next one is 
So that, I didn't want that. Okay, so l let me rush over that. This was not because time is running out. Now I want to talk about triple helix. So maybe most of the people don't like that I do not fully admire triple helix concept. I do, so let me say that. But the question is whether this is really the model that applies to all sceneries all over the world, and my answer is it's not. It does not apply even in the developed countries to all the situation. And what we need is we have to include we have to include the known or less organized entities. They are outside the traditional partners in this uh, scenery. There are many more which are not organized. And we have the known institutional partner of society. And we have, and that is the triple helix very often, say, reports to a local situation. And we have to include the global expertise in science and technology. And so we have to make use of the modern forms of communication and inclusion of many more known organized, known organized uh, partners. And, uh, and also what we have seen from the previous two talks, so it does not apply in the say usual sense to the development world, it does not. So there are many more actors in the known developed world, let me say, or the second world. So this asks for other, other, uh, <coughs> other means. So the quad helix means, of course, the quadruple helix, so that we have to do. So we have to include the known organized partners in the whole scene. And um, that is what I like. So there are now say, concepts which extends the triple helix contact to the, say, quad helix. And this, I guess, really is much more fitting to the scenery all over the world, even in the developed world. But it's, it's even, say, more fitting for the developing worlds. So, so let me, I am surprised, these are, Okay, so what, what we have to take into account that the digital future, and the digital future means that you can leave your, say, home context, that you can leave your, your science and technology park. You have a digital future which is growing at high speed. And that means this digital economy which does not need, say, a site where you build your factories, where you build your uh, factories and other, uh, <coughs> other institutions, the digital economy is expected to grow at 10% per year. And in 2020, half of the population is connected to the internet. This asks for new solution, and the university education via online person is accessible everywhere. And we have virtual scientific labs. These science labs, they, they start, they work for a while, and then they disappear. So you have a greater flexibility outside houses with stones and so on. So this is a digital future, and the whole system has to react to that. I am a bit surprised that these are the slides. Okay. So that is what we have to take into account. And um, so I want to talk at the final four minutes, say, about research clouds. And um, because if you want to build up science parks or local economy, regional economy, then you very often invest in stones, in buildings. And, but right now is that we have a kind of, say, globalized economy, and one should build up means to have access to this global economy. And that is one, what is called research clouds. 
And uh, there's, a nice, there's a nice article by Towns and R. Is there a future for science park? The science parks are means in stone and in buildings to promote the development in, in science and technology. And uh, there are three scenarios, and I want to comment on the second one, that is the rise of research clouds. That means that you need not, need not develop technology, science, at a specific site, in a specific house. You can go to many other places via the internet connection. You can use virtual labs all over the world. And therefore, there's a scenario that is called the rise of research clouds. And real clouds, they provide real-time directory of research space at small independent incubators and pop-up labs around the world. That is an advantage. That is an advantage to available countries. So access to internet is widely spread all over the globe, and they can really have access there. They need not a lab in stone. And clouds easily disappear. They appear on demand, and in accordance the challenge of societal, scientific, and technological natures. And clouds, they include NGO-type actors, and I guess for developed countries, this is a really advantage in science and technolo technology. And clouds serve as a hub for youth science and technology institutions. So I guess there are development using the internet, using our modern digital world that allows developing countries to participate in, a, say, in a way, uh, in the way in technological progress that has not been seen before. So I guess that there are more chances all over the world if you make use, make use of the modern, say, facilities. And uh, so that I was reading. And at the end, I shouldn't say that, but uh, because I was a president of a university for many years, because it's something against universities and science parks. And in my hometown, we have a science park we are proud of. But now I'm a retired professor. I can say whatever I want to say. And I want to say that science park and universe sometimes, sometimes are hampered by old infrastructure. And they have underused real estate all over the world. And also they have governmental interference. And it seems that in the future, there are other ways of science, other way of technology transfer, other way of participation in scientific discovery be besides beyond of the cl classical university and science park structure. So this I wanted to convey to you and I thank you for your attention. Dr. Becker, thank you very much again. The discipline of this panel <laughs> is extraordinary. Our fourth panelist today is Dr. Malcolm Perry, the CEO and Managing Director of Surrey Research Park at the University of Surrey in the UK. He received his PhD, his first degree, and postgrad ed at the University of London and is a member of the Order of the British Empire, which he received in 2006. His topic is the innovation precursors, the role of universities, and the UK is driving innovation. Sir, thank you very much. Hand for... Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the invitation to talk to the forum about the role of UK universities in driving innovation. I'm going to start by putting my comments into a historical context then look at some of the elements of the process and finally comment on how universities are responding to this challenge. In the UK, the systematic investment in research by government and the development of industrial research laboratories uh, began in the 1950s. It was based on a false assumption, which is that moving ideas from science to the market would occur automatically by simply incre increasing 
spending on R&D. In hindsight, that this is a false assumption is not surprising because innovation is complex. It's both a process and an output, and it touches a much wider range of business activities than simply spending on R&D. The technology policies of the 70s and 80s tended to focus on engineering-related activities, which relied on technology push and market pull. Most universities operated from the push end of this process, delivering functional, open-ended, divergent engineering ideas. In contrast, the pull, which was driven by marketeers, produced more deterministic and convergent ideas as they looked for solutions to customer problems. We know that all successful companies still require both a well-defined problem to solve and a well-formed solution that addresses that problem. But the business environment in which to, to find this fit is now also more complex and involves many more players if it's to be successful. To deal with this more complex environment, the UK government, like many others, funded national and regional innovation policies to encourage connection between business and universities. To achieve this knowledge transfer, a new internal architecture for universities was developed. This included the professionalization of technology transfer offices, attempts to better manage IP, creating spin-out and startups, and in some cases establishing science and technology parks. This mission of knowledge transfer has now changed into knowledge exchange, but the structures remain in place, although they have evolved to match the changes happening in business. Which is consistent with what is now emerging as a focus by business on open innovation, co-creation, and on entrepreneurship. The reliance of innovation on individuals extends as far as the opportunity afforded uh, ex is extended by the uh, opportunity afforded by the internet, internet to connect with individual investors in crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and crowd testing of ideas, which was explored by uh, Raymond Brockler in another session. All of this involves a much more divergent, networked, and external focus for business, and consequently, an opportunity for universities. To help shape university business links in the UK, our government has created a number of performance-related financial incentives for both university-based research and the role of universities in business and community development. The measures being used today for assessing research include a competitive regime called the Research Excellence Framework. To do well in this assessment, gives an advantage in future bids for grants, but it also requires research grant applications to set out pathways for impact for any outputs. At the moment, waiting for impact gives an advantage, uh, is around 20% in the assessment process, but it's likely to rise to around 25%. In addition, if research does prove to have commercial potential, then the government funding for universities under its impact acceleration account can provide finance for academics to move technology from technology readiness levels four to six. This helps bridge the gap between research and innovation by providing easy mechanisms for industry to make best use of the capabilities housed in universities. There's also funding streams for universities from government through the Higher Education Innovation Fund to support enterprise, education, and engagement with SMEs. Despite the importance of the quality and intensity of the linkages between the golden grouping of business, government, universities, and the additional element of civic society, there is little in the way of data about these linkages and how they function in terms of supporting innovation in the UK. In 2014, the UK's National Centre for Universities and Business published a report on the state of these relations. The report reviews in its 94 pages 
a series of questions and, and uses case studies to elaborate these. The questions dealt with include how higher education institutions are woven into the UK's innovation system, how well they link small companies to universities, what evidence is there that supports government intervention to promote collaboration that works. It asks what mu must businesses do better to, to absorb univer uh, university inventiveness and conversely what must universities do to improve and bridge the gap? One of the common complaints by business concerns skills shortages, and the report looks at how the education system can address these. It also touches on what kinds of attributes do graduates need to contribute to the knowledge economy. And fin finally, how do universities act as anchors in regions? Not all of the questions are answered, but it does help to answer how knowledge flows in and out of universities and the way this flow impacts on innovation. All attempts to understand the effects of technological progress on economic growth gives the greatest credit to Joseph Schumpeter. Characterization of his idea of waves of creative destruction show how this continual process of change has influenced industrial development over 200 years. Today, we sit in the middle of the fifth wave, which is said to be based on semiconductors, fiber optics, genetics, and software. But based on evidence, this will subside. The trick for any government that is trying to shape the market is to assess what they should support to encourage private investment Rather than leave the emergence of new wave technologies to chance, all major industrial countries and many others are today using skilled R&D workers to sift data in pursuit of blockbuster technologies. However, that's only half the process. What needs to be done, uh, uh, needs, what needs to be done to form these waves also needs to be understood. All attempts to understand the effects Robert Farle and uh, colleagues in Cambridge in the UK, when working on technology road mapping for business, characterized the process in six phases which occurred over time and influenced the size of the market. They're the blue boxes along the bottom. These phases relate to a precursor, embryonic phase, it being nurtured, which leads to growth, maturity, decline, or possibly renewal. There's also transition steps between these phases. And underlining these stages are science, technology, its application and demand, and to help drive this value chain, each transition needs public funding until the market takes over, at which point funding moves from investor to customer, or if it doesn't do this, it fails. The whole process is also subject to potential failure, disruption, and competition and can lead to decline. In this process, the yellow stars represent investment into the technology, and where the process begins to gain market traction, it delivers rewards by extracting money from technology. Within this model, there are challenges for government on how to make decisions about the major investment in the research that creates the precursors, and how to encourage entrepreneurs to deal with the challenges they face on how to take advantage of the market and at what point to enter this. A recent review in the UK has identified 13 technologies that have the potential to disrupt some part of the technology waves which dominate today. These are listed here. And as an exercise, I looked at my own university, the University of Surrey's research portfolio. And I was pleased to discover that we are in fact researching, research active in all of these areas of science and technology. And some of this work is close to market, so we're working with business and industry, including with some of the companies on the Surrey Research Park. This leads to the question of how to gain the optimum return from these collaborative links. The findings of a recent study 
that looked at the links between universities and 200 companies in the UK suggested a number of ways these links can be improved. The main lessons from this relate to how to overcome the cultural difference between the two sides. And this is in all universities, not only in the UK. Achieving this is helped by developing a shared understanding of what each side would like to take from the collaboration. To retain trust, there needs to be agreed milestones for delivery, which should be able to be enforced through a contract. More time needs to be invested in working with both sides of the team rather than managing the process. So talking together is critical. And part of this process is to understand details of IP ownership. These relationships work better if they are carried on in more than a single dimension. So multi-channel links are better. And an example might be to run collaborative research and have research workshops as part of the program. And if joint research labs are established, then new business models need to be put in place to enable academics and businesses to carry out independent research whilst also in in engaging in the collaborative work. This allows both academic and commercial objectives to be achieved. Finally, it's important to invest in skills development, such as relationship development and management, as well as communication skills to help business and academics to understand each other's languages and ambitions, all of which are important in enabling more effective co-creation and co-innovation. To summarize, it's clear that innovation strategies are dynamic, but over time, there has been a growing interest by government in, government in bringing universities more firmly into the frame. The more, engaged, the more universities are engaged in the process, the greater the chance of new technologies emerging that will have an impact on innovation. But the final unanswered question, which can only be answered by time, is what will emerge next and what will affect and what effect will it have? Thank you. Right on schedule, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Our final panelist is Dean Herbert Humbo Chen. Dean Chen is a graduate of Tsinghua University and is the COO of the Tsinghua University Science Park and Vice Dean of the Tsu Park Research Institute for Innovation. Of interest is the size of this enterprise. 400 companies plus 25,000 workers are involved. Tsu Park was established in 1994 with the first building occupied in 1998. His topic today is innovation Ex ecosystem building in Toos Park, the mechanisms for mass transformation of nanotechnology achievements. May I turn the podium over to Dr. Chen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share with you some stories which is uh, really happened in China, in the university. Uh, thank you for the organizer to invite me here. <coughs> to make full use of the 15 minutes, I will show some stories. Uh, it's uh, really happened in China. So how the university can fossilizing the ecosystem to help the small companies to grow up. Those stories is, may not reflect all the effort the university has already, has already made, but it's true happen. It can reflect some, uh, give you some feelings. So the Tsinghua University is the very famous one in China, maybe both in the world. It's a huge university. Uh, you uh, can see the figures, 40,000 students and uh, so 3,000 faculties. Importantly, this university uh, alumni is very strong. Our uh, post uh, president and the current president 
all graduate from uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, I'm very honored to be the alumni with them. So why, how the Tsinghua University fostering the innovative ecosystem? I think they use four ways. The first one, by the classroom. Uh, in the classroom, they create some kind of a new education method. By the lab, they're creating some lab which, in which the students can try something. Uh, the third one is by Task Park, the largest university science park in the world. And the last one is by the Task Holdings. It's a commercial company to providing the, the ecosystem build up. And the back classroom, you can say the Tsinghua University Science Park and the School of uh, Economy Management of Tsinghua University conducting a course called Creation Venture, uh, New Venture Creation. So this course is something special. And you, the student can select this course. This is a formal course from university, but you have to pass the interview, okay? You cannot select this course by yourself. The course can only be selected by the team, four or five people together. And then they will invite the CEOs in Task Park and professors in university to give a lesson. And then the finally, they will meet the investors. Uh, they, they will talk with the investors when they gradu graduate from this course. Uh, actually, they have a very special features. They have a slogan and they have a bag. They have a club. When you graduate from this club, for the course, you will automatically be a, a member of a club, and also they have a fund, special for this course. And a very good uh, result, the last year they have a 52 involvement for the, for the course, 52 teams, more than half creating their own business after they graduated from this course. And also, so far we have 21 in the course, and we already have more many intention for the investment. This is for the classroom. The second one is from the lab. Very interestingly, Tsinghua University and the Science Park creating an extra lab in the Science Park. This is the setup of the extra lab. Now why we, what is the extra lab? It's a, a platform. Uh, it's a platform, the four team faculties of the Department of Tsinghua University working together to create this platform, let the students try something. Now why we need a lab X lab? Because the university want to have a creation, edu a creation education, but the students do not have this ability. University want to have a future leaders educated, but the, the students still have a difficulty on that. And also there is a border between the department, the student in department A cannot go to the department B. So they create this platform so uh, the different department, uh, the faculties can work in together to help the student uh, grow up. Uh, and also they want to have some uh, innovative sprint uh, being educated and created in this uh, lab. And uh, how does the X lab work? Firstly, learning by reading some books, by conducting some special course, not only from university, but also from outside the special course. They can uh, learn from that. And also they have many training, uh, training uh, course, training camp. They can go uh, all the other province and the companies. And also they cooperate not only from the inside the university, but outside from the Zhongguancun Science Park, which is a government running science park, and also cooperate with uh, the Task Park and some internal and external research. So they, they're collecting all the resources and working together. And also, they have a, a dream lab. See, this is a dream lab played issued by the Zhongguancun uh, Science Park, which is, say, is uh, very good. And also, how the X lab work, they buy many activities. They join so many competitions, a championship. And also we have a president club uh, conducted in the university. So if you have a good idea, you can in, in, uh, join this uh, competition. Uh, 
named by the president of Tsinghua University. And also how XLab work, they're providing a simple incubating service. First one, you submit your idea, and they have an evaluation to say it's worth to go ahead or not. And then, if yes, they will give you an incubating service and a support. And finally, if you grows, you can go to uh, the science park uh, or the incubators. So, so it's a process of start from zero and to one. Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the lab. The other part is uh, by Science Park. The Science Park is a very big platform. If you, you have the dream, you go to the X lab, you still want to go ahead, then the Science Park will provide more strong support for your future. So the Tsinghua University Science Park, named Task Park, has a 20 years history now. We are the largest one. We have 700,000 square meters, about 1,000 companies working in the science park. Uh, uh, I think this is a huge project. I wish you have a chance to visit us, if you have a chance to go to Beijing. And uh, this is the incubator is the soul of this task park. The incubator. Uh, have already incubated, say, more than 1,000 companies through the incubation process, and we have already invested 100, and uh, some of them already put in the, in the public. We have the model for the incubator, which is called, called uh, investment plus incubation. Now, how the, how you, when you want to go to the incubator, you go through the process, you put your application, evaluation, and then they, put it, they give you the space uh, in the incubator. They have many activities every week, every month, and every year. Uh, they have different programs to help you. Not only the incubator, not only in Tsinghua University, we have the, the incubation base in other provinces. Uh, so far, we have uh, six incubation base around China. We opened one incubator in the United States in, at the Silicon Valley. Those are the examples, good cases. We are invested and uh, successfully. Those are the samples. We made investment, incubate, and now become a very successful business uh, company in China. The last uh, way is by task holdings. Who, who, who is task holding? I think task holding is the operator of the task park and the incubator by commercial way. Uh, the task holding is a commercial company which is belong to the Tsinghua University. The Tsinghua University run Tsinghua Holdings, hold the equity from different commercial companies. So task holding is held by the Tsinghua Holdings and the main product of this commercial company is a science park and the incubator. That's very interesting. And uh, we have what? 45% hold by the university, and the others hold by the private sector. This is very new in China, and so far it worked very well. Uh, the task holdings have a big business map. Main product is, task, is science park. For constructing and managing this science park, we, all, we set up different companies in different provinces. And also we have a hotel management group, because in the science park, we have always have a hotel, conference center, and we have a financial group, which is providing the financial support for the construction companies. We even have our own high technology companies, which means if we have a science park in different provinces, we can put our R&D center or service center in the sub parks. And other, we have education, media, and the research group. So this task holding is a pure commercial company who running the science park and the incubator. So far, it's running very well. I think this model is uh, uh, very interesting. The, the task holding not work on incubator and the science park, and they also try to create a new science and technology city. Like we are here, we say the smart city here. Uh, in Nanjing, we have two million 
square meters projects working, and we have other projects working in other parts of China. We try our best to put people, play, learning, living, and work together in one town. So we can accumulate and collection more resources to help to create a better ecosystem for the Tsinghua University. So you can see the summary up. There's the four things the Tsinghua University is trying to do to fostering the ecosystems. The first one is they, have, they use in the classroom a uh, new course. The second one, they set up the X lab for the student to try. The third one, they have incubators in Task Park. And the last one, they have a, a commercial company to, to, to help to creating some kind of ecosystems as a business. Okay. This is uh, what I want to share with you this morning. Thank you very much. Well, may I right at the outset commend all members of this presentation today for meeting their times, uh, time schedules. Uh, I have several observations that I would like to make, but I want to make the point that at this time, please think about the questions that you wish to address to the panel, because you've been sitting there very kindly listening, and I think it's now your turn to ask questions. I guess um, I would like to make one observation about the future of science parks, <laughs> uh, because uh, it was actually one of the things the Dadoc Valley being in existence was one of the very major reasons that I decided to come to Korea. In 2006, I was being uh, sort of asked to come to Wusong University. And first question was, what's Wusong University? <laughs> Where is it? And I found out that it was in, in uh, Daejeon. And I found out that Daejeon was also the Silicon Valley of Korea, but it had as its major research hub, the Daedoc Valley. And in the process, I read a Japanese article that compared Daedoc Valley with Scuba. Scuba is the Japanese version, basically, of Silicon Valley and also uh, the Daedoc Valley. It was frightening for the Japanese because the production rate and the realization of from idea into a viable corporation was about 30% higher in the South Korean context than it was in the Japanese. I read that story and I said to my wife, this looks like a very interesting place. So maybe science parks, besides what we just saw is happening in China and other places, do have a very viable role, uh, but I'll let my colleague make a response if he wishes, sir. Response to that? Okay. I'd like to really turn the floor over to the people in the audience because this is your opportunity to ask our panelists for information. I see some a hand way in the back. Please wait till you get the mic because otherwise you need to send us an email. Thank you very much. My name is um, Umar Binder from Nigeria. And I've, it's very exciting presentations, but there are three questions that were put on the table by three of the presenters. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Parry asked, what is the next wave? Um, Professor Pe uh, Becker said, what is the next? Um, science and technology park or cloud park or whatever. And then El Taib brought in the developing country perspective. But what I've been looking for actually is the assessment of the impact of the innovations that we are talking about. I think innovation traditionally is supposed to make people happy, to live well, to live better. But in the last 10 years, we have seen this type of digital, internet, space technology affected 
innovation seems to be making people very unhappy. People don't have time. I mean, when I sit here, I see everybody using their notebook and telephones. So many are not even listening. You know, you know, so it affects people's lives this way, negatively. Secondly, in developing countries, like El Taif said, there, are, there is unemployment. But developing country has too many jobs without workers, and then here you have unemployment. In developing countries, they need roads. This is jobs. They need more food. It's jobs. They need better housing. It's jobs. The innovation doesn't seem to block this particular gap. And finally, um, at the mega level, innovation seems to be making people so unhappy to the extent that the bad people are having access to innovation. We have seen terrorism in the last 10 years. They also have access to this high tech. They are making people so terribly unhappy, and I don't know what next that is going to happen to make sure that we are actually happy as a result of innovation. Thank you. Thank you for the good, very good question. I'll turn it over to our panel after I make the observation that I had 31 years in the military, and innovation sometimes is not to make people happy, it's to kill them faster. So <laughs> there are two sides to innovation, and I'd like to stress the better side now. Anyone would like to respond? Okay, let me. Please. Uh, I cannot fully answer your question. And also, I'm not in the position maybe to tell you what should be done in Africa and other developing countries, but I see chances if we basically follow the principle that have been proven successful in developed countries, but adding elements which are more fitting for, say, the African situation. And I see chances. So let me first say, I admire Surrey and I admire Tsinghua Science Park. Clearly, I, I, if I have time enough, I would stand up and I admire it for the next two hours. But sometimes the question comes up whether these are the models that should be applied successfully. And I doubt it to some extent. But I see that the digital development and also to some extent the access to research done somewhere else in the world by the internet are chances that must be taken. One should not really concentrate on the models that have proven successful in the not completely follow the models. But say, taking into account the special situation in developed countries, but making use of the new technologies. And that is what, why my answer, this will not build road, I tell you that, you know it much better, but these are chances one should take in the developing world. That would be my answer. If I could just add a couple of comments. Um, uh, by example, we have a number of companies on our research park which are actively working in developing countries. One is a machine-to-machine -machine technology company that has developed in association with M-Pesa in Kenya a system for uh, getting solar panel lighting into people's homes, which is, uh, where they're off-grid, very effective uh, and uh, profitable because it prevents, it reduces the use of kerosene for heating and lighting, so it's a, a good thing. We have a company involved with the Nigerian power grid uh, 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 working on our park. We have companies involved in uh, biogas technology, which is highly appropriate, particularly in countries like Malaysia, which uh, uh, we heard earlier was looking to try and develop that technology. And we also have a company called Optegra on our science park that's looking at uh, trying to reduce the cost of um, helping people who have uh, impaired vision uh, at a lower cost to resolve that issue. So it's, it, there is an active process going on um, it's not always completely benevolent because it's a commercial oper uh, operation. But to say that uh, innovation doesn't help, uh, help and produce uh, better well-being, um, I think, is, uh, can be countered with examples that are completely the opposite. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Yes, I think there's very interesting questions when we say innovation have to bring people happiness. But what is the definition of happiness? And what the exactly mean of happiness? For instance, if you want something, you want something anxiously, and finally you got it, 
Is it happiness? If it is yes, I tell you the innovation bring out a lot of happiness. Your children go study in the United States, thousands of miles away from you. You want to hear his no song. You want to hear what he, you want to watch what his living room is. The, the modern techno, digital technology let you realize this is your dream. You can hear immediately what your son singing in the song. So is this the happiness? And also the big companies, they want a big profit, right? They want to have a new innovation so they can sell their products, they can get the revenue. Is that, when they got the revenue, is that the happiness? So if it's a happiness, well, you want to know tomorrow is raining or not. Now who tell you this? Modern technology, modern computer can help calculate one week is a cloud, how many cloud in your sky. It's all technology bring to you. If you want it, your happiness. But unfortunately, there's an unhappiness together with the happiness. For instance, you sit down with your grandchildren, you want to talk with him, but he's always play the mobile phone. So let you feel unhappiness. So we have to make a judgment. You want this mobile phone or not? More happiness or more unhappiness? So I, I, my point of view is there is a driving force. I don't know where it come from. There is a driving force for the high tech companies always produce better, better, better telephones, mobile phone technology. Uh, this is the way we are living in this world. I don't know why. Somebody maybe can tell me why. But the, the ten is there. Uh, the, the, the digital technology will be go faster and faster. Thank you. Mustafa? Well, do, do, Dr. Bing, Binder Omar is always good in triggering discussions and debate. Uh, uh, what I wanted just to say, and I, I put it in one of my slides, is that for many of our problems, the basic problems we have in Africa, Omar, we need only to the existing knowledge. And I, I think I, I have to underline that we don't need innovation all the time to solve the problems we have. The existing knowledge, and there are plenty of it, can help solve many of the basic problems we have in Africa. If only our government will put their money where their mouth is. Well, yes, thank you very much for this uh, most interesting point of assessment of impact of innovation and uh, creating sort of or defining happiness as one of the criteria whether uh, the impact uh, could be uh, um, defined as positive or negative, it seems to me that any type of technology, whether it's an existing one or also a new one, an innovative one, could lead to a good use or to a bad use. And maybe even the same use, depending on the circumstance, it could be defined as bad or good. I mean, what it seems to me important is that we, us, you, people, can make a choice that we have the capacity for making a choice and capacity to make a choice means to know about the technology, whether it is an existing one or a new one. So I would very much urge that uh, we have, people have to be educated, we have to be aware and know what are the chances and risks of an old existing or of a new technology, because only if we know what might be a potential impact, we might be in a position to even judge or to foresee whether this is going to lead to more happiness or more unhappiness. So I would urge for educate and make your choice according to your circumstances. Dr. Perry. If I could just actually add uh, one further example of uh, what I would call local innovation. By local innovation, I mean in introducing something that is well tried and tested. And if you just take refrigeration for simply moving um, uh, 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 injectable um, but di degradable drugs around a country in a place where there's no grid, you can develop a technique for using solar panels to produce a cooling effect in uh, small fridges for, 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 for getting drugs around a country. So in a sense, old technology, local innovation, 
it can be done. But the question comes as how do you pay for that? Uh, and I guess that's where governments have to take a, a, a role in the introduction before it can be commercialized. By leading with some kind of government investment, it's possible to demonstrate a potential, and that potential will in attract uh, uh, private investment. Dr. Ye. So I'm going to give you uh, a non-technology response. Um, I think we're putting everything in context of science parks, uh, things that we create devices, uh, things that are all technology oriented, but there's a, there's a huge social entrepreneurship, social innovation movement that's going on in the United States. So uh, how many of you actually had a yogurt called Chobani? Pro uh, in the US, that Greek yogurt um, movement was very significant. And Chobani was just a little yogurt manufacturer in upstate New York, where the recipe came from, uh, it, from a family in Turkey. And that recipe translated, and it is one of the largest selling uh, yogurt manufacturers in the United States. Um, I think people are looking at, in the United States, also local war. We don't want to uh, import food from everywhere, so people are driving more of raising food uh, products locally and consuming locally. There's a huge restaurant movement in that. Organic farming. Uh, where I am currently in Pacific Northwest, we have more microbrew masters per capita than anywhere else because we get our hops from, I'm giving you a lot of the agricultural examples. So I, I think the, uh, the innovation is taking place much more and much deeper in other areas besides technology. I think higher education institutions are innovating how we do teaching and learning. Uh, those are not, you know, it may not create uh, multi-billion dollar corporations based on, uh, uh, on those uh, social entrepreneurship, but there are people who are making uh, advances in this. So I, I think uh, if we want to look at innovation more uh, expansively, more globally. I think these are some of the examples that they're taking shape. Uh, it's, and it's not just creating chip factories, uh, and it's not, not just semiconductor chips, but sometimes we do have uh, innovators in the potato chip space too. May I ask for one final question? Unfortunately, we're at that time. Way at the back. Thank you, sirs. My name is Victor Lomekun from Nigeria. I'm getting to know much about innovation, about entrepreneurship, and others. But I'm basically a biologist. And uh, I want to challenge us to have a redefinition of some of the things we say. Because I found out that we are recommending the ecosystem approach in the development of science and technology parks. But my little understanding of the ecosystem from a biologist's point of view is different from what we're saying. Because usually ecosystems are closed systems and they are cyclic. They have producers, they have consumers, they have those that will kill you, they have those that will make you to look alive, they have those that are ready to digest your bones and all the rest. And by the time you look at the business system that we're talking about, we're talking of a system that is generated towards more output. And natural ecosystems are not generated towards that. So I just want to excite us to have a way of rethinking the idea of the ecosystem approach. When we do that, maybe we'll have a better terminology. Because I found out that when you talk about the ecosystem, then that's a balanced system. But what we're approaching is not a balanced system. Thank you. Do we have anyone who would like to tackle that question? The question basically is that ecosystem, use of ecosystem as a way to, to uh, describe what we're doing is incorrect because it really doesn't have anything to do with a, a biosystem. What, what happens is that uh, a word like ecosystem um, sort of morphs into a different meaning in, in this context. 
uh, and it's just one of the, the problems with uh, people who are non-biologists picking up on, on, on words and using them, and then they, become, they have a different meaning. But I suppose the idea would be to try and create a system that, uh, in, in terms of production and consumption, does recycle. Uh, and so if, if you can genuinely cr recreate a closed system, uh, an economic system uh, that does that, uh, that, there's more chance of living a sustainable life. So maybe it's an ambition rather than a, uh, a completed process in business terms. Well, we have reached that moment when we're the only ones that stand between you and lunch. <laughs> but I would really like to wholeheartedly thank our keynote and our panelists today. This is the finest panel I have ever participated in, and I'm 78 years old. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>